All right, everybody, get your thinking hats on. I know it's summer, you may have thought we were talk about joy or something, but we're not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson's contributions to Unitarian and American thought were profoundly important, and he is probably the most widely known figure in Unitarian Universalist history. He was born a preacher's son in Boston, the turn of the 19th century, and he eventually entered the ministry himself despite being woefully ill-suited for it. <laughs> he was painfully shy, and he was deeply suspicious of all institutions, most especially church. <laughs> After just three years at Boston's second church, he left the ministry. And he did so ostensibly because he objected to the practice of Holy Communion, which he felt was antiquated. However, Unitarian Universalist historians such as Mark Harris have wondered if Communion was the true reason, or if it's really just because he didn't like people. <laughs> he had deep discomfort with emotional intimacy, and he had a, a disdain for pastoral duties. <laughs> So after being free from the ministry, Emerson thrived, and he made his most important contributions to American philosophy. The foundation of Emerson's work is individualism, which favors individual identity and freedom of action over group identity. And of course, Emerson is perhaps most closely associated with transcendentalism, a gross oversimplification of transcendentalism goes like this. Each of us has a divine, essential nature, and we can uncover and refine that through solitude and congress of nature. Emerson believed that the individual divine spark was threatened by the influence of others. He once wrote, every man alone is sincere, and at the entrance of a second person, hypocrisy begins. <laughs> and he, he wonder why he didn't make it into the ministry. <laughs> Emerson wanted to understand the nature of his divine spark without the interference of other people, of society, or institutions. Again, drawing from that foundation of individualism. These ideas have been passed down in our Unitarian Universalist DNA. We can recognize individualism as the kernel of several of our principles. The first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of the individual. The fourth, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And the first half of the fifth principle, which is the right to conscience. The second half is the democratic process. Some of our most intrinsic characteristics come from this legacy. We would not be who we are without the work of Emerson. And yet, we must reconcile a few facts. First, we need to acknowledge that Emerson is only one person in the line of theologians and philosophers from which we draw truth and meaning. His contributions are vitally important, but they are not the most important, and certainly not the only important tool in our theological toolbox. Second, all ideas need to be understood in their context. Emerson lived 200 years ago, a very different culture, a wildly different religious tradition. We should continue to draw from that legacy but we have to interpret his ideas for our current context. Remember, Emerson was an anti-institutionalist. I think he would be appalled by the way that his work is upheld as an institution <laughs> in our time. There's an irony there. If we really want to honor Emerson, we have to ask how his work serves our current vision and cast aside that which does not. In our nation, and in our Unitarian Universalist Association, there is a repeating refrain of my freedom is more important than your comfort. And I find this 
this deeply troubling. I see examples of this attitude all around me. At one point, this sermon was almost 4,000 words long. <laughs> so in order to keep this manageable, I want to focus on one controversy that is currently underway in our association. I've chosen this specific angle for a few reasons. First, I realize that for many of you, church is arrested from dealing with our current political climate. And I want to respect that when I can. So I'm not going to talk directly about this attitude and personal freedom over collective well-being in our political discourse, but I want you to know that I'm not not talking about that. <laughs> and I want you to connect those dots on your own. But secondly, the reason that I want to talk about what's happening in our association is that I realize that social media is a thing. And some of you probably already know what's going on. I know a couple of you do. And for those of you who don't know what's going on, and those of you who are here for the first time today, this is still very much for you. Because I've heard this line of thinking pop up just in everyday life, and I've heard it pop up even here at BUC. So I want to give us a moment to wrestle with the question of where personal freedom bumps up against the greater good of the group. So here's what happened. A few weeks ago, at our General Assembly, a Unitarian Universalist minister decided that he needed to take a stand against the emphasis that the UUA has recently placed on social justice issues because he feels that it impinges upon his personal freedom. He self-published a collection of essays that began, that began to draw serious backlash, including allegations of racism and transphobia. I'm not a person to automatically jump on bandwagon, so I got a copy of the essays and I read them. And I have to say that I agree. I find them deeply upsetting, even offensive. So just a quick side note, I've decided not to give any credence to these essays by saying their name or that of the author. However, if you want to make your own opinion, I invite you to read my copy of the essays rather than search on the internet for them. And here's why. Searching the internet for essays could promote them online and make them look representative of Unitarian Universalism. That's how search engines work. The more something gets associated with another thing, it pops up. So if you want to know firsthand, I invite you to please read my copy. It comes with delightful notes in the margins. <laughs> Here's why I find these essays so very troubling. They make the case that Unitarian Universalism is being eroded by, quote, safetyism and political correctness. The author uses what I will generously call controversial sources to lay a groundwork of support for his claims that our Unitarian ideal of freedom of conscience is under attack. He provides examples of recent controversies in the UUA issues that I've discussed in this pulpit, including the racism faced by Christina Rivera and the UU World article that so poorly addressed transgender identities in our congregations. I'll say this, the author understands those events very differently than I do, and I acknowledge that we're coming from a different standpoint. But here's the thing. He does have a right to follow his conscience. He has the right to the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and so do we all. What we don't have the right to do is behave in a way that undermines the worth and dignity of another person or that denies the interconnections that bind us together in the web of life. And it's hard to balance these concepts, this freedom of the individual with care and concern for the other. Our principles, our UU seven principles, are not a belief system. They are a covenant. As Unitarian Universalists, this is a set of promises that we make to each other about how we will behave, how we will treat one another. They are a 
a system of behavioral checks and balances that have been called for from the two religious traditions that we have inherited, Unitarianism and Universalism. The Unitarians, like Emerson, were hyper-individualists. They had a vision of a new world that was free of ties to outworn institutions. They wanted to tear it all down and to build something new without the constraints of a bygone era. And on the other hand, we had the Universalists, who are most noted for their social reform movements in education, public health, women's suffrage, abolition. The Universalists wanted to literally build heaven on earth by creating the conditions of a perfect life for everyone through fairness and equity. And we can see that our seven principles draw from both sides of this holy union. And there are tensions. There are tensions between these two traditions that undergirds both the essay and the controversy surrounding them. The author claims that the Unitarian heritage of individualism and being able to claim one's right to conscience is the most important thing in our religion. And the opposition claims the universalist heritage of fairness and equity for all is the most important thing in our religious tradition. There's a little bit of truth on both sides. That's what makes this complicated. Tellingly, the essays actually advocate for splitting our association because the author cannot imagine how these tensions can be reconciled. Well, I can't. When the Unitarians and the Universalists merged in 1961, they did so because they needed each other. After a century and a half of thinking about it and knowing that they had shared touch points but focusing on their differences, they decided to put it aside and merge a couple decades after their youth had already emerged. Both traditions were dwindling in favor of mainline Protestant Christianity. And they decided that they were better off together. I still believe that we are better off together. We need each other. But the merger always favored the Unitarians. Financially, power, the name. It always favored the Unitarians. I think it's time that we correct that. As Forest Church reminds us in today's second reading, a healthy developmental arc begins with dependence and infancy and childhood, followed by independence and adolescence, and then maturing into interdependence and adulthood. Those early Unitarians were working to carve out a space for the nascent American individual the fierce individualism that Emerson contributed to Unitarianism was appropriate, even necessary, when our movement was young. However, the time has come for us to temper this fierce individualism with the interconnectedness of the Universalists who believe that we all shared one common destiny. It is desperately important that we learn how to do this. We all know that our congregations skew hard towards white, educated, upper middle class, people over 50, cis, straight. We know this. It's not a secret. It's not a thing to be ashamed of. But we can't pretend like it's not happening. We also know that our country's demographics, especially the younger generations, are different. And we're not connecting with younger people. We fuss over coffee hour and greeters and being more friendly to folks. You guys, that's not it. If we want our liberal religious tradition to have meaning and value in the 21st century, we have got to let it grow up. 
coffee hour and all that other stuff is important. It's really important. But first and foremost, this is about us, you and me, as people. It's about who we are as a faith and how we treat each other. It's about growing out of that hyper-individualism that disproportionately attracts some people at the expense of others. We have overemphasized our Unitarian heritage of individualism, and now we must make a course correction toward our universalist concern for others. It is time for us to come into our full maturity and to be the beacon of hope that this world, that this nation right now so sorely needs. We must grow out of our independence of sense adolescence and embrace interdependence. During a time of deep struggle with how oppression is unintentionally showing up in our congregations, causing harm, keeping us from growth and relevance in the 21st century, <laughs> writing a set of scorching essays about the right to conscience is a great illustration of the underlying the mature response to these concerns is not, I'm an individual and I won't be told what to do. No, we are called to acknowledge our interdependence in the web of life by listening and trying to understand what marginalized people are saying about their experiences in our congregations. Interdependence means believing to our core that we need each other that common destiny that our universalist forebears preached was an eternity spent in love and perfect harmony. They believed everybody went to heaven. We were all going to be together forever. That's what they believed, and that's still with us today. We imagine it now as a web of life in which we are inextricably bound. In this web, we know that our actions have an impact on others. Therefore, my right to individual freedom is not more important than your right to be free from harm. We are in this together. We have to learn how to balance our needs and how to take care of each other. The contributions of Ralph Waldo Emerson were essential in the foundation of the culture of our country and our religious tradition. We would not be who we are today without them. But it's time for us to take the next step in our development. Emerson once wrote, and this is a long quote, but it's important. A person will worship something, I have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for what we are worshiping, we are becoming. We have too long, as a country, as a religious institution, or a religious institution for too long we have worshiped individualism. Now, I'm not suggesting that we abandon this part of our heritage altogether. <coughs> Just as parts of who we were as teenagers stay with us throughout our lives, so will individualism remain a core component of Unitarian Universalism. Personally, I will always, always love the Smiths and flannel shirts, Doc Martens. But that's not my everything the way that it was 25 years ago. It's a part of me that I reach for when it's appropriate but it's not the default. And so must be the way of individualism. Always a part of who we are, but not the default. Our default must be love, concern for one another, and service to the interdependent web of life of which we are a part. That is our path forward into maturity and relevance in the 21st century, and just as much part of our past as individualism. May it
Mesa um, in, in Blessed Me.